Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here. This is the third in a series of videos covering the various manga adaptations in the Fate series. If you haven't seen parts 1 and 2, go ahead and do that, then come back. So far, we've poured through the works of Stay Night, Apocrypha, Extra, and Grand Order, but we're still not done. There are five remaining manga that each cover one of the Epic of Remnant chapters from Fate Grand Order. This includes the Seraph event, as that one was also absolutely huge and occurred around the same time. Without further ado, let's start with the first Epic of Remnant manga, the Shinjuku Phantom Incident by Sasaki Shonen. Let's give this Shonen a good Yorokobe, yeah? First off, it's interesting to learn that Ritsuka gets dressed up prior to a ray shift. Whatever happened to those specialized plug suits, anyway? What was their purpose? The manga makes things feel more dramatic, such as Mashu's fear when Ritsuka starts falling from the sky. In general, actually getting to see a lot of this stuff is way more impressive than the game. Even Moriarty can look like a badass. Oh, and remember that exploding baby? I prefer this rendition of the scene. The dude jumps in and drop kicks him. Of course, my favorite aspect is getting to see Salter in all sorts of poses and from tons of dynamic camera angles. Picture perfect. That extends to her adorable doggo, Gaval II. The manga depicts their relationship exactly as I imagined. <laughs> There's a bit where Mashu, who's stuck observing this time, watches Ritsuka in their sleep. Da Vinci then teases her, suggesting she use the Sheba lens to peep on Ritsuka in the bath. I don't think they would mind, really. It's just not a fate work without this iconic camera angle, am I right? For reference, if you want to make a Jolter fanfic or something. I ask you, are you my master, or whatever? I love seeing this fluffy doggo completely reject Moriarty. The animal instinct is just incredible. This manga turns Phantom of the Opera into a genuinely horrifying villain. He's kind of a loser in the game, but here, holy crap. The fact that he makes those coloraturas from real people's organs is way more intense than the game could possibly portray. This manga's been in the works for a long time now, but it's returned to the spotlight for this ballroom scene. Jalter's dress is just amazing. But the real surprise is cross-dressing Ritsuka. With FGO being in first person, we can now actually see what this looks like. It's surprisingly adorable. I love how the mangaka went ahead and drew a whole ensemble of cross-dressing Ritsuka designs. Now that's fan service. So yeah, this manga's still ongoing, but it's far superior to the actual game, in my opinion. Let's see how Hideo Takenaka's adaptation of Agartha holds up in comparison. It's extremely faithful to the game, and the art is great. I feel the manga better shows how it would look for a world dominated by women. Dudes being shown around like hot property. Here we've got this pirate chick using a dude's stomach for a game of darts, forcing other men to take part. For absolutely no reason, Hideo went all out on this random NPC. In her own work, she could be a really popular character. While the game did show off Astolfo's school uniform, this full spread is totally worth your time. Same goes for Deon. Their embarrassed demeanor really comes across, doesn't it? Clearly Munier thought so. <laughs> he has to be carried off to the infirmary. God, that's hilarious. In Wu Zetian's kingdom, she has the men publicly executed. Seeing this gives Deon flashbacks to the beheading of Marie Antoinette. This panel is especially ominous. To contrast that, there are plenty of fun moments too, like Astolfo and Deon making dramatic tokusatsu poses. Did you know Penthesilia can literally punch a dude's head off? Well, now you know what that looks like. A couple of pages are used to show Wu Zetian's backstory, which again, is always welcome. FGO's game does show how Scheherazade fights, but I think this page makes it even clearer. These little guys are so funny. Back at camp with Columbus, Astolfo washes Ritsuka's hair, which makes Mashu jealous. Even Columbus himself gets flashes of his past. I hate the guy, but all servants deserve to be fleshed out like this. Huh, here's a cool shot of Deon. I just felt like sharing it. I'm excited to say that this manga shows Penthesilia's backstory, her fight with Achilles, and the moment she decided to hate him for calling her beautiful. 
What I can say the game legitimately does better is Columbus's freaky face. This is a close second, though. Here's a visual of Scheherazade's past, when she was forced to entertain King Shariar, else she be put to death. Huh, so this is what the guy looks like. It even shows the horrible things he did to his concubines. These backstories are always amazing, and no amount of text can really compare. Another iteration of this exact same shot. Will bang, okay? Excuse me, what did you just say? This manga is actually complete. The translation isn't, but the raws tell the entire singularity. Not bad. The Shimosa manga by Rei Wataru is an astounding read. For one, this time we've got actual female Ritsuka. I generally prefer her, and even though the animes don't acknowledge her, I'm glad some of these mangas do. The art here is very bold and intense. It makes the action stunning, and also makes the looming threat of death all the more believable. It's fitting, given Rei Wataru also does the key visuals for Fate Samurai Remnant. We all know that Ritsuka usually has a group of servants who travel directly alongside them, though in battle, we can use whichever servants we have in the game. I like how this manga shows what it's like for Ritsuka to summon servants just for the fights. They show up, help out, then peace out until they're needed again. Ritsuka interacts with Shimosa via her dreams, and this manga takes the time to show her asleep at Caldea, along with how everyone's worried about her. The outside perspective is nice. It even shows the exact moment when Ritsuka gets pulled into the singularity. She was just discussing Musashi with Kojiro, and then suddenly collapsed on the floor. Becoming one of Ashia Doman's pawns is shown to be far more tragic. This reminds me a bit of when Artoria gets corrupted by the shadow in Heaven's Feel. There's no way they would let the game get this graphic, but when the story mentions villagers getting massacred, this is more compelling than text could ever convey. Even the more light-hearted parts are depicted with stunning detail. Female Ritsuka sleeps in her undies. Nice. I like how Muramasa sees visions of Shiro using unlimited blade works. It's a cool touch that clarifies just how well a pseudo-servant understands their host. Picking the female hero usually results in a Yuri paradise. I appreciate how, unlike Persona 3 Portable, the relationships aren't altered just because the hero is now a girl. Since Ritsuka summons unique servants for battle, we're graced with some cool combinations, such as Leonidas shielding Musashi's advance against Tomoe Gozen. We've also got some Tomoe backstory, her parting with Yoshinaka. When she's defeated in the singularity, she gets to glimpse his face one last time. Poor girl deserves a hug. Aha! There's a random swimsuit selfie at the end of Volume 2. Very cultured. Back in Caldea, the other servants have to restrain Kiyohime for being too worried about Ritsuka. <laughs> it's so silly. Apparently, Ritsuka is like a mother figure to Jack, so in her absence, Mashu tries to fill that role. Absolutely adorable stuff that wasn't in the game at all. We know Edmond Dantes is often running around in the background gathering intel for us. This manga takes the chance to depict some of his adventures. Dude's way more active than you might think. Since Mochizuki Chiyome is cursed by Yamata no Orochi, a monster linked with Ibuki Doji, Shuten is able to essentially enhance that curse. The toll it takes on her is nightmarish. It definitely turns Chiyome into more of a tragic figure. To fight Orochi, Ritsuka summons Caster Ku and has Wicker Man duke it out kaiju style. I never knew burning wood could be so powerful. These heroic spirit swordmasters are terrifying. Without Musashi destroying their core, they just regenerate, and these visuals don't hold back. The fight against Raiko is especially brutal. Muramasa helps out in the manga, enduring even as swords pierce through his flesh. He's pretty used to that, isn't he? This manga is ongoing, leaving things on a controversial cliffhanger in which Onui and Tasuke, the cute innocent kids, are seen melting in Kotaro's arms. Whether this is an illusion or some fake-out is unknown as of now. Sometimes the chaos on page is so much it's hard to decipher. Because of that, I recommend this manga as a supplement, not a replacement for the original game. The Seraph singularity is absolutely insane, and the manga takes that to a new level. I don't recall the game ever actually showing the Seraphix oil rig, but here it is. 
we get to see a version of Kiara before she's all corrupt and the head of a Buddhist sex cult. Of course, if you remember this singularity, that doesn't last long. The downfall of the oil rig's crew is portrayed in excruciating detail and feels a lot more terrifying. I like how, when she encounters the demon god pillar, she inherits memories from the priestess Kiara. These little details aren't shown anywhere else. It's cute when BB shows up and refers to Ritsuka as senpai. Mashu's triggered, since that's supposed to be her special thing. <laughs> If you didn't know or perhaps forgot, Suzuka Gozen doesn't wear underwear, and the mangaka was certain to make that abundantly clear. Hell yeah! Given she's a central character, there's no shortage of Meltralis shots, almost all of which feature cultured poses and angles. In fact, this whole manga is like a love letter to Meltralis. You have to read it if she's your waifu. Speaking of poses, they just had to include this one. Everyone's a copycat. I appreciate how Melt has glimpses of her time in Fate Extra CCC. She recalls the female Hakuno Kishinami, as it should be. I suppose I hadn't fully realized, but Melt literally melts when she's damaged. Glad the manga visualizes this. Ishtar makes a sexy appearance here. The artist is quite bold with those abdominal details. It's not the best depiction of her, but it's definitely worth the spotlight. This manga is loaded with battle scenes, perhaps too many. The benefit is that a lot of random servants show up as cameos. They do a gorgeous Nito crease. While the game was able to fit King Protea into the rerun, this manga instead gives us one of the very few appearances of Kazura Drop. Seriously, without the manga, she would hardly be worth mentioning. It's great that she's finally getting used. Now, is it just me, or did they make passion even bigger than before? I'm sure that's important to some of you guys. By far, the most valuable thing in this manga is how it illustrates the entire backstory for Emiya Alter. Specifically, how he's a version of Shiro who is tasked with killing Kiara. Her cult was growing too much, and even though it had innocent members among its ranks, he imagined the corruption that would infest it before long. He had to slaughter Kiara's followers to get to her, and this included his world's version of Taiga Fujimura. Basically, Emiya Alter's so stoic and cold because he's trying to cope with having murdered his own guardian. This was only hinted at in the game's text. Again, this manga is still ongoing, though it does seem to be coming up on the end at least. Our last manga to cover in this series is Salem, brought to us by Aoi Omori. Their art is much simpler and cleaner. Not necessarily a bad thing. Like Shimosa, it once again uses female Ritsuka to my delight. Right after the group arrives in Salem, I'm sad to see that they choose to give Matahari a more covered up outfit. Instead of her sexy dancer attire, she's now more like a bar wench. That does have its own appeal, but man, what a loss. Abigail and her friends get caught chanting witchcraft in the woods. In the game, these other girls don't get sprites of their own. The manga's a step up in that regard. In the same way, this manga actually gives Tachuba an original design, not merely reusing the Queen of Sheba's sprite. Same goes for Kazaya Mason, another NPC who gets a proper design now. Was Kazaya ever even mentioned in the game? I seriously can't remember. When the crew puts on their theater productions, we actually get to see them cosplaying as other historical figures. It lends to the authenticity. Ironically, actually seeing them on stage in costume is more believable than just using the original sprites. About halfway through, though, the scene merges into a genuine flashback from the Queen of Sheba. I'm glad to see these gorgeous girls carry on in Matahari's absence. Ritsuka has a nightmare where the witch hangings remind her of all the death she's experienced in past singularities. It's a neat callback to previous events. Yet again, we double down on the fact that Ritsuka sleeps in her undies, this time with Mashu. Obviously, that can't possibly be the case when it's male Ritsuka. Huh, Mashu's usually so innocent that I can't really see her and femme Ritsuka as a couple, outside of doujins anyway. It goes without saying that actually showing the hangings is going to be more intense. Not quite as dark as Shimosa was, though. This isn't entirely relevant, but I'm happy to see a page that has both Mordred and Ushiwakamaru in the same frame. This alone is worth your attention. 
Ritsuka has yet another nightmare, but this time, Dante's helps her out from inside. What a lad. Lavinia seems way more threatening in this manga. She's got a dramatic fight scene with Robin Hood. Well, her monster does, anyway. Look at this weird thing. Not even nursery rhyme could conjure up this freak. What we lose out from Matahari, we get in spades with Cersei. It's impossible for her to not look hot. We get a surprise flashback to Robin Hood's past. I just wish it were longer. Mashu also has a nightmare, one in which she realizes she can no longer protect Ritsuka as a servant. These moments of psychological turmoil help add to the sense of powerlessness the characters feel. Going along with this, Ritsuka has a nightmare where Mashu slices into her throat with a knife. This is way more extreme than the original story. When Matahari is put on trial, we see some of her backstory. Or her backside, if you know what I mean. This part was decently written in the game, and the manga provides appropriate visuals. We also get to see what she looked like when she was put on trial in real life, accused of being a spy. It helps explain why she's so willing to go along with her sentence in Salem. The guilt from one is bleeding into the other. Sadly, the Salem manga is still being made, and there's a lot more for it to cover before the end. I'm willing to wait, since it's gotten so good. Thank you for watching all three parts of this dive into the various Fate manga adaptations. While many fans wish the Lost Belts and Singularities could all get their own anime, that's unlikely to happen. In manga form, however, it's being done all the time, perhaps to even greater quality. While there's certainly some redundancy in the Fate Stay Night mangas, the FGO ones feel necessary. The worlds and stories told of in that game aren't done justice by that rudimentary visual novel format. I hope that, one day, all of these manga will come out in English so I can physically collect them. Until then, or even if not, they're still worth tracking down, translated or otherwise. Have I convinced you to dive in yourselves? Let me know in the comments below! Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all our anime lore, discussions, and Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or a YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like spicy exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Video Gamer 75, Dante Pendragon, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, The Nonchalant Ostrich, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Lord Ormagoden, Free Brick, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Link Pendrago, Observer Bellis, James Hewitt, Uncanny EXP, Zamas Autonomous, Scout, Yukie Eidos, Crow Kalem, Saul Soto, Tristan Riggin, Major, Caitlin P, Sogai CH, Vladimir Rovna, The Taz 96, Jonathan Padua, Kengo X 77, Hersha of E Rated Hands, Alester Bernadotte, and Akakaze Yume. Thank you all so much!